Is here. My name is Peter Liu. I'm a postdoc in physics at Harvard University, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the experiments that we have going on right now on the International Space Station and uh, how we're using CUDA to uh, try and accelerate some of the processing that we're doing. Uh, we have, because it's a space station, there are astronauts on board. We're able to work in an interactive way. So the astronauts are actually controlling the experiment. They take some data, they send it down, we can process it and get back up to them. And so the, uh, the sort of message of this talk is how we're using uh, accelerated processing through CUDA to tighten that loop a bit and to work in a more interactive fashion. So uh, I'm, uh, again, the postdoc, and this has been my experiment. My advisor weights at Harvard. And then um, you'll see here a bunch of names that uh, say NASA and ISS. Those are astronauts who have been serving on the International Space Station for the last about half dozen years. And really, they're the ones that have innovated the actual experiment and the data taking uh, for this particular project. And then we've had a lot of help from a lot of the uh, a lot of folks in uh, graphics and chemistry to do some of the more practical details of the experiment. So um, I'm pretty much used to a very informal style of giving talks. So if you guys have any questions, just interrupt me in the middle. We're, we're, it sort of covers a bunch of different areas. So it's probably better to say, OK, this, you're not, you're not, no, you're not making any sense. Why don't you explain that before I go on to something uh, completely different? And uh, all right, so without further ado, let's take a look. So the theme or the, the, the area that our experiment is trying to understand is liquid gas phase separation. And I'm just showing you a picture of a cloud here to point out exactly what we sort of mean by these different phases. So you have water vapor in the air, which you can't see. And then you have liquid water that's condensed around dust particles. And that makes a cloud. And you have water that's sort of in liquid form, evaporating and condensing. And it's sort of going back and forth in some kind of equilibrium. Now, um, this is sort of to harken back to those high school chemistry days where we're sort of looking is in this region of the critical point. So there's a certain set of temperature and pressure conditions that uh, around here, the liquid and the gas become more and more similar until eventually they're the same. And over here, you have something called the supercritical region where there's just a fluid. There is no difference between the liquid and the gas. And all right, so why do we want to go to space? Well, you can think about liquid and gas of the same substance the liquid's always going to be denser. So it's always going to settle toward the bottom of a container. So if you, say, have a mixture of liquid and gas and you shake it up, or alternatively, you might think of it as, say, a salad dressing where the oil is always going to float on top. You shake it up, you can sort of mix it up temporarily, but eventually it's going to settle out. And in the liquid is always going to fall to the bottom of the container. Now, the reason that this is blue is we, we don't use an atomic liquid uh, per se. We have these micron-sized particles of plexiglass, and these are called colloids. And the reason why we like them, they're transparent, but when you shine just white light on it, it kind of reflects in sort of a bluish color. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the chemistry details. I mean, I can certainly get into it sort of for the purpose of understanding what's going on. You just imagine that if there's more of the blue color, it's like the liquid and the gas is more like, uh, the, the black is more like a gas. And so again, on Earth, the blue, the denser part, just settles to the bottom, and you don't really see very much of interest. It's as if you took salad dressing, shook it up, and just let it settle out. You're not going to see anything. But what happens if you want to understand a little bit more about the geometry or the shapes of the structures that form during that process? And for that, we go to the space station, where now you'll see that the light and the dark are starting to sort of separate from each other. But uh, the, the, the lighter part, it's sort of slowly settling, but it's not really sort of falling to the bottom. Now, this movie here that I just played two weeks, so you saw this bubble rising, and there's a little bit of a sort of acceleration on the space station actually due to the upper atmosphere. But this bubble here, this little bit of a gap because the cable got loose on the camera, but that bubble took like a day and a half to rise. So it's not as though you have, you know, you play back the movie, it's a little bit deceptive. You think, oh, geez, the bubble's just rising to the top. But this is a few weeks worth of, of data. So the experiment itself is pretty simple. Oh, so yeah, so we, we, have, we, we send up a bunch of different samples, and this is you know, the amount of colloid or the sort of uh, density of these particles, and then we add some polymer to make them sticky, and we sent up a bunch of different sample compositions. We just want to see what happens. So I think, as you might sort of anticipate, based on what you see on the ground is not necessarily going to guide what you see in zero gravity, because on the ground you see everything kind of collapse and fall to the bottom. That's not necessarily what's what, what's going to happen. In fact, you kind of don't really know ahead of time how it's going to work when you send it up uh, to space. So we sent up a whole bunch of different samples, and we want to understand exactly 
what uh, their behavior is going to be once they get up there. All right, so this is, this is sort of one of those really simple experiments with one particularly complicated ingredient. So we have a camera, we have these samples, and so these, these little glass vials of these mixtures of these colloids. And then we just take a picture with the camera. And the, the one complicated part is sending it up there. So in fact, the first samples get sent off to Kazakhstan, and they launch on one of those Soyuz rockets up. And then the second time we did the experiment, and it was in the payload of the space shuttle. So it's pretty exciting to see this, this sort of you make something, and now it's sort of floating around uh, in, in orbit. And uh, here's a picture of astronaut Mike Full, and those are, this is a sample holder sort of from the side on, and you can see that he's taking a picture with the camera, and there's a flashlight, and eventually we'll, we'd replace that with the camera flash. And uh, there's another astronaut a few months later, again, taking a picture. Uh, here's the samples. You can see that again. There's the camera, and uh, able to um, sort of capture images that way. And if you take a look at the... Um, initial data, we start out with, um, you know, you sort of mix up the sample. So after it's separated, you, you mix it up with a magnet, and then you just kind of let it sit. And so it starts to coarsen and coarsen, and you see this network forming. It gets thicker, and then eventually you have sort of what looks like salad dressing after it's uh, been settled out. But it took 100 days. And it's not something, I think, that we're sort of used to. You imagine if like salad dressing is settling on the counter a few minutes and it's completely separated. This is taking you know, hundreds of times, thousands of times as long. So we're able to look at this phase separation process in a very delicate regime by taking out the effects of gravity. Now, uh, initially, when we did this back in 2003 and 2004, the first iteration of the experiment, we, the astronauts would take the samples out of the cabinet or wherever they stored it. They would set up the camera. They would snap a picture, yeah, take, use a this flashlight, take a couple pictures, and, and then put it back away. And then you know they have to go do stuff like fix the solar panels or do a spacewalk. I mean, it's very difficult to get time for the astronauts to do this. And this was pretty time consuming. So the first time we did this, we had, you know I don't know, something like 10 images per sample over the course of six months. The, so I think this at the end is something like six months. So you know it's nice. And if that's you know, how you're going to do the experiment, then, OK, if I only have to analyze one image per week, I can do this by hand, right? I mean, there's no need to have any kind of processing. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you could do it with uh, you know, any kind of code. So you know, for the first, you know, when we were doing this, it's fine. But then you kind of have to ask, as a scientist, is this really what we want to know? You know, does this, does this give us the data that we need? And in particular, if we only have a couple of data points for each sample, it's pretty hard to measure the dynamics of what's going on within them if we can only sample, you know, once every few weeks. So instead, what we did was tie it to a computer that's running a program called EarthCam. And this is actually a program that they came up with where middle school students can program in so that you can go onto the web and you find the flight path of the space station. And so when it's above a certain spot on the ground, if you're a student, you can ask the astronauts to take a picture. So what they do is they clamp the camera into the window, and they plug this camera into the laptop that's running the software. And it knows that at a certain time, it's corresponding to a certain location on the Earth. And in a fully automated way, it just snaps the picture. So some, some pretty smart guys at NASA said, well, why don't we run your experiment that way? So instead of having the astronauts set it up, take a picture and put it back, why don't they set it up, get all the focus and the lighting right, and then just have the, the computer, like an intervalometer, fire at some programmable rate to get the pictures for you. And so when we do that, instead of having one or two pictures per week or you know, 10 pictures for the course of several months, we now have hundreds. So let me show you. Uh, what this raw data looks like. So this is a sequence of images we get. And now we want to process that. You can see it's jittering because the camera can wiggle. So the first thing we do is to stabilize that footage, if you will, so that it's no longer jittering around if we want to start to see. And now you can start to see the dynamics a little bit. But well, let's take out the uneven lighting because you know, you're sort of angling a flash at a high angle and there's some shadows. So we want to take that out. And now you can see these really white and really dark particles or spots. And those are corresponding to some dust in the image. So we want to take that out. But you know, again, I'm looping it at the same time over here. And you can start to see things much more clearly. And then finally, with the last contrast enhancement, you can really see the dynamics of this coarsening of these uh, samples as a function of time. And now if we look at the different samples that we have made, now they have slightly different compositions. And you can see that uh, as we play this now sort of at a constant rate, that 
some of the samples are phase separating much more quickly than the ones later on uh, with a different composition. So that, that the rate of coarsening, the rate at which these structures are developing is changing with the sample composition. And so we want to be a little bit more quantitative and try and understand exactly what's going on and again to try and put some numbers on that and we also know very well what the original sample compositions were so can we correlate those two quantities and from that understand a bit more about the physics of the system. So you know how are we going to do that? Well let's go back to say a point here and if you look at it, the structures aren't all that different, except for their sort of size. You could imagine that if you sort of zoomed in in a region in here, you would end up with something that looks kind of like that. And so how then should we quantify these differences in the sample? Well, you could imagine, I think the easiest thing would be is to look at sort of a characteristic size scale. And by that I mean, okay, so I'm in some bright region in the sample here. How far away do I have to go to get to another bright region? And on average, it's going to be a much larger quantity here than it is going to be over here, right? So you could say, you know, maybe, maybe this distance, the width of my hand, is the characteristic sort of bright to bright distance over here. And maybe here it's, you know, maybe a quarter of that or something. And we want to do this uh, in a way that averages over the entire image and doesn't really take into account you know, orientation. So what we're going to do is calculate an autocorrelation. And um, by that, I mean I'm going to take an image, and I will multiply it by a copy of itself, and then keep that product as a function of the offset that I take it. And so you, you sort of do this multiple, many, many multiplications. So it's something that I think is kind of immediately suggestive that a parallelism might work because you're taking the image, you multiply a copy of itself by a certain distance, and then you move it at another distance and multiply it and keep that result. So in sort of the cartoon version, let's say we have a, a three pixel by four pixel image. And so I'll take one copy in red, and then I'm going to offset it by plus one in X and plus two in Y, and that will give me the center of the blue image. So we've got these two images. And we're just going to multiply the overlapping pixel values in this region here and keep that sum. And uh, you know, we can normalize it by the total number of pixels or whatnot. But in the end, it, it, that doesn't really matter so much. And so you can see that you know, I've just highlighted in gray here which are the pixels in that overlap region. And we'll take that sum and store it in this output matrix over here. So these images, this is an X and Y image coordinates, I'm using sort of the lowercase uh, letters for that. And over here is capital X and capital Y. And so the answer here is so plus one in X, plus two in Y, that's the offset. And we'll just store the value of the sums of all of these multiplied products of these pixels in that particular element. And then because we're multiplying an image by a copy of itself, it's symmetric. So plus one plus two is the same as minus one minus two. And so that's why these elements are the same. So let me step you through. Uh, sort of, if you will, my journey as a scientist, I've never really actually taken a programming course. So, you know, how did I sort of get into this and what was our process? And in a way, it's kind of an example of, I think, how this might be used in the real world by people who are sort of trying to sort of grope in the dark to get a handle on how this GPU stuff works. So, as a scientist, the first thing that, I'm in mean, physics and everybody uses MATLAB. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, before I get to that, I should show you what the output data looks like. So here is this two-dimensional matrix of offsets. And you, there's a peak at zero, because obviously the image is 100% correlated with itself. And as you shift it off, that overlap, if you will, that sum of the overlap products of the pixels goes down. But then it, it comes to some kind of low trough, but then it comes up again. And what I've done here is taken an average over all angles. Essentially, if you sort of take a bunch of rings and then calculate sort of what their height is. And you can see that the peak here starts out at 1, and then it falls, and then it comes up to a secondary peak. And that's what we're defining as the characteristic length scale in the image. That's, again, saying if I'm in a bright spot, how far on average do I have to go to get to another bright spot? And so how that position of this secondary peak changes over time is going to tell us how these samples are evolving. All right, so uh, the first thing is just in the naive MATLAB way of doing this is to just loop over those offsets. So again, offset plus one, plus two, or whatnot. So those are two outer loops. And then I sort of take the uh, product of the overlapping portions of the matrix and just sum it up. So you know, here we do the multiplication, and then we just you know, sum, sum, and that's it. I mean, the, the, the development time for this is you know, measured in minutes. And it gives the right answer. It's nice. It's very convenient. 
and uh, it's also very, very slow. So if I calculate the execution time as a function of the offset, now remember, so for an offset of 10, that means that I do all of the multiplications from x equals minus 10 and y equals minus 10 to x and y equals plus, n, uh, plus 10 and y equals plus 10. So it's really 100 operations. So this ends up, this is a logarithmic axis here, and this is also a logarithmic axis, and you'll see that that sort of asymptotes nicely to a slope of 2, which means it's going essentially as the square of the number of, of that offset. All right, so it behaves as it should, and you can see that the actual time, if we want to calculate that offset up to a few hundred pixels, it's you know, like in excess of 10,000 seconds. That's three hours for one image. So to generate this image, we're talking about something that takes 10,000 seconds, which are this data, you know? So that's, that's a really long time. It's not really feasible if we're getting images down, say, in the morning and I have an hour or two to get some feedback to NASA. Is this experiment working? Did the astronaut unplug the camera? We need to analyze that stuff. I don't have, you know, if I have 24 images that they shoot at once an hour or something, I don't have 240,000 seconds to get an answer back to them. So, you know, this is easy to code, but it's really not very good. All right, so then the next thing we did was just move to what I'll call a naive C code fragment. So we keep the outer two loops over the X and Y offsets, and now we just load the image into an array and multiply the pixel at IJ by the pixel at I minus X offset and J minus Y offset. It's the simplest thing you can do. You've got four nested loops over the X and Y offsets and then over the X and Y pixels of the overlapping area in the image. And then we just sum it up and, and keep it. And so I just run it through a regular C compiler and this is about 30 times as fast. And so you can see that now up in this region where there's a few hundred pixels of offset, it's taking what, like three or 400 seconds. So it's something like, you know, on the order of five minutes. So, you know, that's still a, you know, a long time if I have, say, 12 images or 24 images and I need to get this, you know, done quickly, it's still quite tedious and then you realize you hit the wrong parameter. I mean, it's not interactive. It's still sort of a, a pretty long time batch type process. So then we got slightly more clever and said, well, if I've got a pixel at X and Y in one image and a pixel in X and Y at another image, in general, they're not going to be anywhere close to each other in memory. So we're not taking advantage of any kind of caching. So the first thing we did was just to reorder the loops. So I'm going to loop over that Y offset, so the separation in Y, but then I'm going to move a couple of the loops so that now the second loop is going to be over the Y coordinate of the image, the third loop over the X shift, the offset, and then the final loop is actually over the X coordinate. So I, I exchanged one of the offsets and one of the image pixel coordinates, which means that then when I'm looping over X pixel coordinates, I'm picking off adjacent values that are probably, you know, they're going to get cached. And then when I do that, I can also enable auto vectorization in the CPU's compiler, in the Intel Compiler 11, and then it will start to use some of these SSE instructions and give us uh, some extra factors. So when we do that, um, I get like an extra factor of like four or five. And now it's, it's not so bad. It's something on the order of a minute. And I, I sort of give these as examples, I mean, not because I'm you know, the world's greatest coder in simple ways by any stretch. I mean, this is kind of a demonstration of ignorance, if, if anything. Uh, but to really show that, you know, if you're not an expert programmer, what are you sort of inclined to do on short notice? And, you know, this is, this is a pretty reasonable thing, I think. You know, if you know enough C, this is the type of thing that most people could more or less do. And, in fact, this was the code that was used to publish a previous version of uh, some of these uh, types of samples. And this was the, just the ordinary C code that they you actually know, not this, the previous naive C. They didn't even sort of reorder it and uh, recompile with the auto vectorization. But the, the difference between the naive C and this ultimately is some housekeeping, but flipping around loops and changing a compiler option. And I mean, I think that's you know, something you could reasonably expect somebody to do in a real world situation in the sciences, even if they're not an expert programmer. So, okay, so then we have a choice, right? We could either go crazy with the CPU stuff, or I said, well, why don't we try out some stuff with uh, the GPU? So the first thing we did was to just naively implement the, uh, that essentially the naive C code, where we loop over X and Y offsets and then assign every thread to do the entire multiplication. So each thread then has uh, two loops over X and Y coordinates. And that really wasn't very good. It gave us something of like a factor of two over the C++. And there was, you know, it wasn't really very impressive and worth a whole lot of, of time. So instead, um, we came up with a, a very different algorithm. And this, um, in a way, is, is, is reflective of this uh, 
reordering of the loops. And so we're, we're going to sort of take things one line at a time. So what I'm going to do is instead of trying to do like a two-dimensional block of this image, uh, the problem is the images are, say, 750 by 1,500 pixels, or say roughly 1,000 pixels on a side. I can't take a substantial chunk of that image and fit it in shared memory, because shared memory just isn't big enough if I want to have a bunch, enough threads to sort of keep it filled. But if I do it one line at a time, then it's not so unreasonable, right? So let's say the line is roughly 1,000 pixels wide. I've got two of them because I want to mon yeah, multiply two lines, and now you could figure, okay, given how many warps and how many threads and, you know, say maybe three or four independent blocks can execute when they're time sharing and I can spread out my latency. So that was kind of the strategy. At 1,000 pixels wide, you can cram, what, like four blocks or something before you run out of shared memory and you're probably going to run out of something else beforehand. So it's kind of a nice convenient size. But it, it is a limitation in that sense because that means that you can't handle images, for instance, that are 10 times as wide. And I think that's sort of one message that I found that you have to essentially make some decision on how you structure your program based on a comparison of the size of your data to the actual architecture. And it's very difficult to make some kind of generic statement that will apply for all these different, different things. So for the size of the images that we needed, this was a smart, I think, the, what, what works. Okay, so I will load these two lines of images into shared memory. And then within a thread block, every thread will handle the partial sum of a different x offset. So by that I mean, okay, so thread one will handle what I'm calling x equals, delta x equals minus two. And then thread two will handle delta x equals minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. And the nice thing is we get a lot of compute intensity per unit bandwidth, if you will, because these two lines only have to be loaded into shared memory once. And this also has a number of other good features. So uh, every time so the blue block is accessed, well, thread one, thread two, in the first time step, thread one is multiplying, uh, you know, all the threads are taking this value and loading that into, into their sort of, into a register. But because they're doing all from the same shared memory load, it's a broadcast. You don't have any kind of uh, worry about a shared memory conflict. So for this value, you take advantage of the fact that from shared memory, when you broadcast the same value to all the threads, there is no penalty. So you can immediately do that. And then in the other case, the, um, the second value that it's multiplying changes for every thread. So it's this one, then this one, then that one, and it keeps going down the line. So no two threads are accessing the same element of that array in shared memory, and we can then cut down on our memory bank conflicts. And then finally, what we do is we take this output and write it to an array in global memory. But now uh, we have a little bit of an issue because the value that's here, the result of thread one, is not the final value in this offset matrix. It's only the contribution from one particular pair of lines. And we need to accumulate all of the results at that x offset from all the different pairs of y offsets, essentially, and all the different lines within that. So we then have to use, um, there's, there's a couple things you could do. You could write a temporary structure out in global memory and then have a second kernel sum it up. And I tried that first. But then with the newer compute capability 1.1 and later, we're able to use an atomic to accumulate all these values without having to uh, explicitly keep track of when anybody's doing anything. And that, in fact, gave us an additional 25% of performance. So just to step you through the code very quickly, Here's just the kernel, and you know, there's a whole bunch of other housekeeping, but that's pretty boring. Just load the image and assign it to a texture. There's really not much else. Um, and so the first thing we'll do is just declare two lines in shared memory. And this image width and offset size, those are constants because we can't do dynamic memory allocation uh, within the kernel. So we can set those sort of broadly a little bit bigger than the size of the image, but we also know that the size of the images are more or less fixed, so it's not going to change very much. And then, uh, then the, in the second case, we just uh, use the thread ID and then go very quickly through and uh, set everything to zero. Now, again, um, because, uh, and this is, how should I say, I'm not so sure this is necessarily the best programming practice, but it works in this case that every thread ID corresponds to a different x offset. So I can do this thread ID x equals zero, and it will immediately initialize all the relevant values in shared memory to zero because I have that many threads. So in fact, you have to, Really, you have to have one thread per x offset, and so it's just a one-dimensional block. And then once we're finished initializing, we synchronize them. And then in the second step, we do a block load from a two-dimensional texture. So I just break this into a number of blocks. They grab it, and um, you know, from this input texture, which is a 2D texture for the image data, 
and I'm using this UMOL24 intrinsic to increase the performance of the integer index calculations. And then so I load um, you know, from texture one into the first line, and I load from the other line into the second uh, shared memory array. And then when that's finished, we also do a sync threads. So now we've got those two lines. And uh, as I'm showing here in the graphics, they're now sitting in these shared memory arrays. The next step then is to just do the multiplication. And here, it's very nice and simple. So we're looping over the x coordinate. So we're stepping through the x coordinate of the image. And I'm just accumulating the sum of image data 1 at this x coordinate times image data 2, the x coordinate plus that offset, which is the thread ID. So again, this here is the same for all threads. So we can take care of that with a broadcast from shared memory. So there's no latency penalty. And then in the second case, again, we're accessing, every thread is accessing a different element of the array. So again, no memory bank conflict or, I mean, yeah, no sort of, you know, no serious memory banks problems. And then that's finished. And then finally, um, we do the stuff with the atomic to put the output there. And then unfortunately, you don't get, we've done all this in floating point, but then the atomic, you can't write to a floating point number, but we don't have a huge amount of precision. That's a great concern. So I just multiply it by some large number and then round it to an integer, and then I add that to the atomic, and eventually you accumulate such a large number that uh, any sort of small errors in the floating point are irrelevant. I mean, you have to be a little bit careful because if this is too big, then you overflow the integer. But for what we're doing, we're able to find a sort of happy medium to make that possible. All right, so when we do that, uh, this is the performance graph. And you can see that uh, even at the offsets of just a, of a couple of hundred pixels, that's one second, two second, three seconds. So we're between two and three seconds, where the MATLAB code was between 10,000 and 20,000. So uh, it's a pretty substantial performance increase. Now let me point out one thing about MATLAB. So you're going to hear, you hear a lot about this, oh, we should have libraries, we should have plugins, and we should make it easy for people who don't know anything to program, and you know, they don't need to think about it, they just run our software, and voila, everything goes faster. But it doesn't really work out because MATLAB has a lot of inefficient, inherent overheads. So in this case, you know, MATLAB, just to open the image, and close it. I mean, this is zero or you know, offset of one where you could go to zero, it doesn't really matter. But that is just essentially opening the image and putting everything into memory. By the time MATLAB does that, you can follow. CUDA has already calculated it to 100 pixels. So I mean, it's basically by the time it opens and closes the file and, or you know, even writes a blank output, uh, the CUDA program is essentially done. So even if you accelerated MATLAB by a million times, it's still going to be a lot slower. So I think that's something to keep in mind that, yeah, you can accelerate one little part of your code, but these are not um, synthetic. It really is start the timer, load the image, do the processing, print the output, stop the timer. So this is really the, the, the number that matters to me in terms of real world execution. You can see there's a substantial change in what's going on. And you can also see that this, this sort of asymptotes to a constant here. And I think essentially this sort of 150 milliseconds is the startup cost of the program to load the image and get the library started and whatnot. And I think if we're sort of batch processing images, that's going to go away on a per image basis. This is sort of the one time startup cost. So for very, very small offsets, for which this really isn't even that useful, uh, the C code is a little bit faster. But that's really not anything scientifically interesting. Anything we want to know is going to be up in this area. So when we do that, we can look at the speed ups. Relative to MATLAB, the GPU code is 4,000 times faster. Uh, the naive C here is something what, between 30 and 40 times, and the C++ is still something like 200 times or some, 100, more than 100 times faster. And then if we looked at it sort of in the opposite way, the GPU code relative to the other codes, it's 4,000 times faster than MATLAB. It's 130 times faster than C, and something like 30-some, 40 times faster than the SSE C++ version. And so what that allows us to do then is to calculate these oops, curves uh, as the samples are coming in and uh, to see what, they, uh, what the behavior is. So you can see that this is that one dimensional curve. Here's the movie, which I'm playing it around, or playing again. And you can see that we can watch that dot, look that yellow dot marking where the position of that peak is, it's sort of moving outward as the, the movie progresses, showing that the sample's characteristic length scale is growing, or that it's coarsening as a function of time. And then if we uh, look at the actual data, you can see the results of these uh, improved analyses. So before, what I'm showing in the white 
outline symbols are the data that we get from shooting these images one at a time. So we got like half a dozen points on this graph up to like a million seconds. And you can see that um, you know, it's, not, uh, it's not bad, but it doesn't really fill in like the open symbols. And that gives us uh, a bit more of uh, real data and tells us, OK, well, first of all, it agrees, but also that these things are moving in a nearly linear fashion. And we can start to understand a bit more the dynamics and the physics of what's going on with these samples. So I think this is probably the most uh, relevant graph to the, the audience here. But um, yeah, I think we have a few minutes for questions. I want to thank you guys uh, for attending. I know it's the end of the day, and there's uh, a lot of other things going on. And I really, I, I really should say thank you also to NVIDIA for really supporting this. And David Lubke, uh, you, whom you saw introduce some of the speakers, I mean, he's been fantastic in supporting all of this work and just the company in general. So I'm really grateful to you all and to NVIDIA for being here. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, I, I, uh, so the question was, how did I run across a GPU being a physicist? Well, I, I've kind of followed this uh, for a while. I mean, I've, uh, sort of, I've sort of seen the evolution of GPGPU over, say, since like 2000. I've, I've been an NVIDIA developer for a while. And it always seemed that uh, there was a lot more horsepower there to be had. And I think it was very difficult before CUDA to sort of get anywhere. I mean, I was never really capable enough of doing those sort of texture tricks and getting that stuff to work. But then when CUDA came out, I think it was more like, oh, this is actually kind of cool, you know? And just, just trying to, it's a really neat technology. And you want to, I spent a little bit of time trying to understand it. And then I said, well, why don't we try and see if we can get something interesting to work? And uh, this turned out probably a little bit better than we had anticipated when we got started. But I just, it was mainly just for fun. Anybody else? All right, well, thanks a lot. <laughs>